Hi, I'm Jennifer Sproul, Chief Executive of the Institute of Internal Communication, and I'm delighted to be featuring on Remote Control Season 2. Hi, Jennifer. Thanks for joining us for Season 2 of Remote Control. As the Chief Executive of the Institute of Internal Communications, you're pretty much our dream guest. Welcome. Well, thank you. I like the title of dream guest. I'll take that today. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a pretty good one. Not, don't dish those out willy-nilly, so that's good. Um, so the main focus of our chat today is the new report that the IOIC published with Working the Future, uh, the business case for world-class internal communication. Before we delve into that, though, I was just hoping we could talk a little bit about what you've been hearing maybe from the members of the Institute of Internal Comms about how the past crazy six months have been, challenges, progress, uh, yeah, anything like that, really? No, absolutely. I think I think crazy is the right word to describe um, the last six months. In terms of, you know, what I'm hearing and, you know, talking to a lot of practitioners and some of the survey work that we did at the beginning of the crisis, I think challenges wise has certainly been pace it's been a really really difficult one because internal comms we are typically quite lean machines we're not big teams you know some organizers are where you're very lucky but when you're sort of a team of one or two with the volume and pace of communication that needed to happen at the outbreak um it was just an awful lot so i think there's been a lot of challenges in taking care of ourselves as a profession uh, and, and dealing with that but i think then on the actual impact side there's been some great things from from for internal communication we've certainly seen a rise in the increased engagement from employees with internal communication we've certainly seen better impact with leaders um, and things like that and i think that there were other challenges around is the rapid use of technology i mean at the beginning of the outbreak internal communicators were implementing projects that were supposed to take sort of six months in two days so I think that that has been a real challenge, but it's been a real reward. And we have got to know our technology better than ever before. I mean, we've always had a lot of this stuff at our fingertips, but we've never really understood it in a new way. So I think that's been um, a wonderful sort of, it's been a challenge, but also an opportunity to really shift forward some of those projects that were perhaps a little bit more kicked into the long grass. Um, and I think that obviously from a positive point of view, we've certainly felt more included and more out there in real pivotal conversations and being able to really get closer to our leaders and then seeing a real impact with trust with um, engage with employees. Going forward right now, where we are with challenges, I think there is certainly trying to understand and plan what 2021 should look like is really difficult. Um, we've been through a lot. We, our emotions are changing as employees daily. So understanding that one size fits all, because some people have loved working from home. Some people have hated it. Some people want offices. Some people don't. Some people like virtual. Some people want face to face. So figuring out how to make a long term internal internal communication strategy that meets the needs of everybody, um, I think will be really difficult. We still, I think, a very uncertain environment. Yeah, no, no small feat that really thinking about Not really. the, <laughs> the changes that have happened this year uh, we, we we all hope they don't happen to the same degree next year i guess yeah absolutely uh okay so let's talk about the report a bit more and it does cover some things some challenges and some of the issues that you've mentioned there from the past six months um and the first part i want to talk about was there's a really i lo actually love this page near the start of the report that highlights the evolution of internal comms uh, and I kind of took from it that it's a huge shift away, and this isn't probably new news for, for a lot of people, but there's been a huge shift away from kind of broadcast comms like newsletters and maybe even notice boards in, in some kind of workplaces. Uh, I'd love to hear more about what the report identified as a future. There's things like trust and transparency, uh, emotionally intelligent comms. It'd be great just to talk around the future aspect of that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, you know, in terms of where we've come from, that, that newsletter and that event management, there's still an element of that. But the, the future is now no longer necessarily about being a disseminator. It's about being a facilitator. I'm not saying that, you know, we're going to suddenly stop sending out emails and being seen like the postbot. There is always going to be an element of that in the role of the internal communicator. But in terms of the future and where we're going, it's much more thinking about it is this relationship role and how we connect the dots in an organization which is is far more 
led by behavioral understanding, understanding people, how we behave, what we want to behave, as opposed to just thinking, there's an announcement, let's send it out. So when looking at the future, we're talking about the, the social CEO. So it's that CEO that's out there, that's available, that you know, that says I have an open door, but truly has an open door policy. <laughs> And it's perhaps stripping some of that traditional corporate armor to be more emotive in the style of language that, that we've seen. We've certainly seen the impact of language through this pandemic and how, and we've perhaps looked at it with more of a critical eye than ever in terms of how we're conveying our message. And then I think there's this other role around then making sure we're, we're being that sort of facilitator between two. Um, and also trust and transparency as first principles. I mean, trust has been a linchpin for organizational survival for, for many years. I mean, we all look out for the Elderman Trust Barometer that comes out every year, yeah. which looks across, you know, the key institutions of government, media and business. Um, and it always shows what opportunity there is for businesses to build trust where perhaps those other institutions aren't doing the best job, I shall say, in the most polite way possible. <laughs> um, and I think that if you get trust right, it really does have a massive impact on loyalty and motivation and to truly engage. And it just shows how important trust is built internally. And trust is, is built on a basis of transparency. It's built on a basis of I'm being kept informed authentically and honestly. And communication plays the role in building that trust. And if the organization gets this right, it will improve well-being, productivity, how people talk about their brand, the, you know, therefore then sales and profitability and but to do that has to be based on emotional intelligence and um, an emotionally centered communication as i said is a real real trend trend and change that we've seen brought about by the pandemic so organizations that have led with more kind and emotional language as opposed to jargon and tone which is cold and perhaps a little bit of corporate sti stiffness have seen a real impact on how their employees then feel about their organization then consequently how they work uh, that's really interesting, actually. So it, even down to the the words, the copy that are being used that kind of has a real impact on how the employees are engaging and feeling about their situation. And I guess it's the out of the office thought of it as well, instead of being surrounded 20, well, not 24 seven, but while you're at work with the um, maybe internal comms messages, you're at people are at home in their spare rooms or in the kitchen and it's just a different setting to to receive those internal comments so yeah i guess i guess the words do mean even more maybe absolutely and, and like you say the context is different you know and context and, and communication yes it's it's verbal it's spoken but it's also it's feeling it's emotion it's the physical environment so that whole context is different and plus as well there's what's going on in our personal lives and what we're seeing in our external communication that's impacting us as well so it's really thinking about that context of the receiver in a very very different way yeah just one extra thing on this one and it was something i saw it was a almost like a case study on, on on BBC News, it's around trust actually that, that made me think of it. And there was a company that uh, had installed a bit of software on its remote workers' computers that took photos every few seconds of their screen, and then the the their boss, their manager, would then kind of review, have the opportunity to review kind of what people have been spending their time on. And that just struck me as something that was not at all trusting and personally if that was applied to to my role um that would be kind of a real turn off from from the company i was really surprised that, that those type of things even exist in this at this time really yeah i agree it's a worry that people feel that they need to do that because that doesn't engender a great working environment for, for me personally i think that would go the opposite direction I, I think that work of the future is based on choice and trust and i think that one of the greatest feelings that's come out of this pandemic, we've heard it a lot through many channels and, and, in, and in the public media as well, is that what people have really enjoyed is they've been saying for a while, I know what I'm doing. Trust me on my output, not on the hours that I work. Yeah. Give me flexibility and I will do more for you. And that will make me feel liberated. And we have seen that payoff in spades by implementing technology that, that I guess creates that kind of monitoring sense. I mean, for, that would personally would not appeal to me. I, I want to be judged by what I do and how I make an impact, not necessarily on how many hours I'm available or typing on a keyboard. And that's how we need to look at productivity is about output. It's not about time spent. 
Yeah, totally. I, I was really surprised that that this type of thing had been implemented, and yeah, it just did not seem uh, in keeping with some of the success stories and things that you hear in the mainstream media about people working remotely and, and from home and the care that the organizations have shown them. So it's, yeah, it's a big surprise. Yeah. Um, so one of the highlighted quotes from the report is in terms of crisis and tumultuous change, it's imperative that we feel as connected and cohesive as we can. Human beings crave structure and connectedness above all else. So I was thinking given the, ch- the current change event, which is obviously COVID-19 is pretty, pretty high up on a tumultuous scale if there was such a thing and it's kind of scattered work for workforces far and wide it seems even more crucial for organizations to prioritize internal comms i thought, I thought that quote really spoke really clearly to kind of the current situation yeah absolutely i mean i think we've we've seen nothing if not how important and how impactful internal communication is and you know, yes, we all accept the virtual way that we're living and some of us like it and some of us, as I said at the beginning, it can be quite divisive and our job as internal communicators is to bring that back to a connected whole and to consider all of that. But, and actually how we do that and bring people back together it is communication. It is how we facilitate that connected world and how we do all things. And if we don't get that right, we won't work well with our colleagues. We won't understand what it means to us. We won't feel in the loop. We won't feel like we know what we're doing has purpose and has meaning and has impact. So it's really, really important to consider that out. And I think this word of change is just thing we need to really think about. We know that change goes wrong largely because of poor communication. I think what we've seen through this situation is internal communicators are being brought in much, much earlier to the process. So they're being involved in those kind of task force looking at the impact of COVID and how we make those changes. And I hope that that will show the need to bring in internal communicators at the very, very beginning of a change program rather than at the end of a change program because change is behavioral. It isn't instructional. It, it has to be considered in that sense. And so you have to think about the environment that you're creating and how the flow of information is happening within organizations that's driving that behavior change to make it really, really, really have impact. So we need to make sure there is a level of human connection. And I understand that can't necessarily be physical at the current time, but there needs to be a way of virtual human connection. We need it. It's, it's in our DNA, it's, it's how we're built. So our challenge of internal communicators is thinking, how do we create that in a very, dare I say the word hybrid world that we're going to potentially going to be living in? Yeah, and I guess it's different for each individual as well in terms of the how comfortable people are with the technology, how comfortable maybe different um, regions, even within the UK and, and gl- different countries globally, are allowed or able to return to to workplaces it's it, it will vary massively i guess for internal comms teams on potentially person by person certainly team by team yeah absolutely and, and that's why perhaps this trend of really thinking about our audiences and profiling them perhaps through a new lens will help us think about that we can be often with audience segmentation we can think of it by role or department or we can sometimes wrongly or rightly make assumptions based on age and that they have a certain preference for certain things i think that perhaps through this we should look at our segmentation through through a new lens as opposed to well you work remotely you're in the office you're here you're there so think about it in perhaps a different way. So we really start to bring in that, that sense of audience understanding. And that's where listening plays a really, really big role. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. The, um, the report outlines eight areas as, as part of the business case for internal comms. It'd be great to talk about a few of them. Uh, mm-hmm. The first one is kind of a bit of a carry on from what we we're just talking about, actually. It's digital transformation is, is driving continuous change. And... I saw a quote, um, it actually came up in a a previous podcast recording from the Microsoft CEO that said that we saw two years worth of digital transformation in two months. You've just said yourself about projects that were going to take months were getting implemented within two days. Um, Kind of the report talks obviously about without effective comms, change programs fails. You just talked about bringing internal comms people on board at the beginning rather than the end. Change is happening so fast at the minute and can really go awry if comms is going wrong. I'm just wondering 
if you had some tips maybe for some internal comms teams who maybe feel a bit overwhelmed by either the scale or the pace or both of their company's digital transformation absolutely i think feeling overwhelmed is a really good place to put all of us right now i mean i certainly feel some days very overwhelmed when looking at the future of, of the institute and, and how we operate in this in this new world and i guess my advice with that is always to try and break it down a little bit um, often it is to kind of look at all those change programs that are going on and try and put them into groups and into buckets and then and then stitch them back together is to step back from it all um, and I think that that's important to carve out that time in our diaries to give us the moment to think through rather than just react because often we're just going at such a pace and I know that sometimes is easier said than done but it's really really important to take a step back and, and actually really review where we're at what's gone well what's not gone well Right, now let me engage with all of my senior stakeholders, all the ones that are in charge of putting together their change programs, whether that's looking at how they are perhaps transforming the way work is done within their organizations because they've made digital improvements. Um, not necessarily about how we use technology to communicate, but how we use it to do our actual work. Um, any other change that's going on in the business and get close to them and really understand them uh, and build that relationship so that perhaps when your your job is to look at all the change that's going on in the organization and to think well if that's a 10 change measures going out in a year how is that going to make the receiver or the the employee who's having to respond to that change think feel and do and therefore almost to go back to some degree going that is too much and it's too fast because change isn't a Gantt chart. It is, but it's not just a Gantt chart. And it's not like we go through these processes, we send out these communications, we do all these things, we turn on the system, we go live on this date, job done. <laughs> There's the change that goes after that. You know, change is not, it's, it's emotional, it's, it's circular, it's wavy, it's all other shapes that perhaps the linear Gantt chart doesn't give. Um, so it's then to almost, I think, look at all of that context and then go back to your stakeholders and go, well, actually if you did that change alongside that change that is not going to go down well let's maybe almost recommend to do less or to consider it with a new lens or to pace things out differently um because that's obviously our job is to see everything that's going on and then maybe influence internally so that they're not trying to do too much change too quickly because change takes time yeah and your point around change isn't a gantt chart i think that makes total sense when you consider that the change is affecting, it always affects people and people don't come along on a journey at the same pace. You know, even in, you know, in a, in a classroom situation, people learn at different, at different speeds, learn in different ways. And it's, and it's totally the same at work as well. I, I can just think about the team I work with. There's lots of different working styles, learning behaviors. And yeah, I think but it, that just that little phrase really struck a chord with me about change yeah. not being a Gantt chart. Uh, yeah. I, 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 we mustn't look at it like that. Um, that that's not how we operate that's not how we are as humans so we're, we're talking a little bit about change and i'm just wondering and this is a question that I, I was just wondering kind of as a whole really and i don't know if you've had any insight from the members or as part of the report but there's obviously a huge shift as you've t spoken about and digital transformation digital products put in, being put in place and implemented quickly and some companies were just kind of going from quite um, traditional methods to the to these kind of you know Microsoft Teams virtual conversations meetings um, and I just wonder if the wholesale change will perhaps slow down and, and new systems implementations will slow down and it's actually the optimization ironing out any wrinkles maybe that would be some of the main focus for internal comms and change programs oh yeah i would agree i think that you know in looking at how we've used technology through the lens of internal communication i mean we've certainly you know i've never seen myself on a camera so so much in the last six months and um, <laughs> certainly learn more about my own personal mannerisms um <laughs> which i'm trying to work on but it's very difficult um but it's it certainly has been a lot more pace perhaps to some degree less polish which has been a good thing but i think that we have learned how to use whatever you're using whether that's teams or zooms or yammers or slacks or all the technology that, that is available we're certainly understanding the tools that are in front of us in a new way and i think that absolutely there'll be less 
perhaps time to add more, but to stand back from it going, and I'm going back to that point, what has worked well, what's not going well? Let's really think about how we use them differently. So it's more about understanding how they've been used as opposed to let's add more on. So I, I, I do agree. I think that the, over the next few months with the technology from an internal communication perspective will be less about perhaps new, but more about reviewing, adapting, and really leveraging what we've done. So it really works with what the needs of our audience are in the future. Um, technology or change transformation in terms of the business or our organizations and how we work and what we work and what we do, whether that's the use of more automation or changing of tasks or looking at new processes and systems in, in the way that we do our everyday job. I think that some of that change is going to continue. Transformation has been big on the agenda for a while. So we need to make sure we understand that those transformation projects that are happening alongside how we're asking people to use the technology that we are implementing as communicators, um, because that's a lot for one person to look at. But I, I certainly agree that it's going to be more about understanding what we've got rather than keep adding new stuff. Um, in the coming months from an internal comms perspective. Yeah, I guess there's only so many tools people can use and um, being available all the time via the instant messages or maybe sometimes even video calls can be a bit, like we said before, overwhelming. So yeah, getting the teams to understand how they get the message across in the best way makes total sense. Mm. Uh, I found the next session I wanted to talk about was um, the section that covers the changing workforce demographics and it covered areas that I didn't really even consider to be kind of demographics. It talks about the mix of new technology, different communication tools, the focus on inclusion, which is not just related to business, but everything really at the, at the moment can present some challenges, but also lots of opportunity when it comes to effective internal communications. And I was wondering if you could maybe highlight some of those opportunities that it, it, it gives yeah absolutely i mean obviously there's been a lot that's happened in the last six months but also the the, the inclusive nature has also been been a big part of that agenda and, and, and we've talked about it for many time but i i do feel that there's a real swift towards improved action in this area so and i talked about a little bit earlier when i talked about audience segmentation and looking through that through a new new lens as internal communicators the one area that i think we have really uh, stand out from a crowd as a real differentiator in terms of our skills and the way that we're really um, building our knowledge is in our ability to understand human behavior. It's the utilizing of behavioral insights and technologies and, and things like that to give us a better informed picture. So there are more demographics and more types of people in the work, but we need to really start to think about it as a, from that inclusive nature. So there's a real opportunity there. So let me just take an actual example. So we've always talked about remote workers, that they're a real challenging audience. They, they've always, you know, those that are perhaps based in our manufacturing sites, you know, in our factories, or those that are field-based, or, or some that somewhere they have computers, somewhere they don't, or things like that. I mean, they've always been a challenging audience. And they're an audience that we've had for, for decades, um, perhaps, uh, you know, so it's something that we keep, keep talking about as well. How do we make them feel part of something? How do we make them feel a sense of inclusion and belonging to the organization? And perhaps now with the advent of technology and we're finally looking at things with a fresh lens and a fresh perspective, we can finally make that, get over that challenge to look at everything as a homogenous all and think about our, our strategies and our tactics to break everybody feeling included in the organization irrelevant of their location their role their ethnicity their age all those things so it really starts to do all of that and using our behavioral understanding to do that better so perhaps for me that perhaps could be one of the opportunities is to really start to look at that with a new lens and finally perhaps get over some of those long-term hurdles we've talked about yeah so perhaps some of the the changes that we've been forced to make this year will actually t help tackle the those long-standing changes that we have to make but are still struggling to do. That's really interesting. I hadn't, hadn't kind of thought about that progress that's been made this year applying to other situations. That's that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I think, and I think as well, we've seen more people engage they, because people now have to engage with technology who perhaps didn't have to before because it wasn't a requirement of their job. They didn't need to know anything. They're starting to engage more because of, because of what's going on in the world. So there's a real, I think, opportunity to think about how those behaviours have, have changed and how we can make that feel more inclusive. Yeah, it seems like everyone has been on a 
Zoom call or a Facebook video chat, WhatsApp video chat with, with members of their family. So taking that back into the workplace will potentially be less of a culture shock potentially or technology like technology shock to, to people. That's in, yeah. you know, interesting to see how the external factors and people's external lives will maybe benefit some of the internal commons projects. Mm. The report also talks about a pre-coronavirus, if you can remember such a time, a <laughs> crisis of mental health. And it's really hard to see how this could have been made better during 2020. Um, I was wondering if there's some advice, some steps for internal comms teams on how to approach this aspect. And also, do you think it's harder for a remote workforce, or you know, workforce that's mainly re- remote these days? Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that we had, a, you know, a mental health crisis pre-COVID, and 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 this is going to even you know, deepen that crisis even further, which is a, a real worry for us as a society as well. And therefore, we have to take as organisations, we have to take our role seriously in terms of what we do to support and create that dialogue um, for for those individuals. I think that. Remote working, like I say, it's, some people have really enjoyed it, some haven't, but I think it certainly leads to more isolation. And isolation is a worrying thing when people are dealing with issues that you perhaps don't know about. So we have to be really, really conscious of that. Um, and so we have to think about going back to that point earlier about how we create better community and better connectedness in our internal communication strategies to help combat perhaps some of that, that isolation. Uh, my advice is to really, I guess, listen to all employees and develop an improved approach to those who are perhaps silent as well as those who are vocal. Um, and we say it a lot, but we, you know, sometimes there's things to be learned from what isn't said from just as much as from what is said. So I think we need to really think about that. We have to be able to then create an environment where we create that comfortable sense of uh, conversation. It's it's meaningful art of conversation, making sure there's rapport, all those things. So it's the importance of how are you, how are things going, rather than we seeing we come on a call, we're connected with our people. It's just all about task stuff. So we really need to really invest in perhaps training up our people to think more so about having meaningful conversations. So that they, that there is that sense of creating more open and honest and comfortable place for people to to really share. Additionally, we need to also make sure organisations have systems and processes in place to support people with uh, mental health challenges, from whether that's a mental health first aiders programme, whether that's making sure you have the right resources or the right charities or the right places for people to go, I think is really, really important. And those are policies to that. Um, I think Going back to my point as well, one of the things that we really need to work on, and we've talked about it again, this is perhaps another opportunity that's come out of this pandemic. Um, we've talked about it for many, many years in terms of line managers being a real, real challenge for internal communicators. Perhaps now is the time to really, really get that investment or get that, that support to help train them. Because often if you're struggling as a person, your, your context or that, that person you have that conversation with is either your colleague or perhaps more, more most likely your line manager. Are we giving our line managers the support to have meaningful conversations? Are we giving them our line managers the support so if they notice something that isn't quite right, what are they supposed to do with that? Where mm. are they supposed to go with that? Are, you know, what's the support that we're giving them in those situations? And then, and then the other thing as well is making sure that you know, uncertainty is going to be the continued theme, I think, for, for a year or so to come. So it is that importance of keeping people feeling informed. What creates further stress, further anxiety is when you feel there's secrets or when you feel that no one's being honest with you or I reckon there's something going on, but no one's telling me. If you have continuous, everyday, open, honest dialogue, that will help combat some of that. So I think there's a number of things that we need to be doing, but I hope that's some some practical tips to think about. Yeah, and that last point you made around the open, continuous kind of engagement conversations that really harks back to how we started the, the, the recording, which was talking about the social, it was social CEO, but, you know, a social leader, line manager being more uh, open and approachable via the, these video channels and instant messages. I guess that's kind of, yeah, it ties in, ties in well with that. Absolutely. Uh, that actually is a nice segue into the, the next part about the, the changing face of, of leadership. And it talked 
really interestingly about how leaders are needing to change. The events of this year have made this even more clear, and we've, we've mentioned that as well. I'd love to hear a bit more about the changes leaders need to make and how internal comms can maybe help with this as opposed to seeing it as, yeah. a, as a blocker. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 I mean, I've spoken to many internal communicators and, you know, and it really does depend on your leader and your organisation. There's some some leaders that have a natural real value of internal comms, a natural warmth in the way that they do things. There is some where they're really scared and nervous about putting themselves out there. So as internal communicators, we really, really have to help them and coach them with that. But one of the best outcomes, another opportunity that's come out of this pandemic for internal communicators is how actually our leaders have had to get more on board with being open and honest and being vulnerable. Um, and that's another thing is, is allowing that vulnerability to shine through. So one of the things that's been really great is to see leaders in their own homes, not with so many ties, you know, ditching some of that arm and going, I don't know the answers. I'm struggling too, but I'm here for you. Yeah. Talk to me. I'm available to answer any question, even if I don't know the answers. And when we have seen the importance of leadership communication is so prevalent throughout the last six months. So for me, I think that this is hopefully... A shift that's here to come and our job as internal communicators is to show back to them because we're asking our leaders to go out there sometimes in a place that they're not comfortable to be that level of vulnerability and to be more rough and not be uh, go off script yeah. you know often we've had to write script them and now we're saying we're not going to write you a script we'll give you some bullet points just just talk and that can be a very very vulnerable and scary place for leaders so our job is to really coach them through that but also show them at the end of it the impact that that has had because then that will give them the confidence to continue. That will make them see, actually, by doing this, this is having a real impact on the well-being of my employees, but also on how we're operating as a business. Now, looking at that productivity, looking at that, that, that um, output and how people feel about my organisation, how my employees talking about us externally. If we can, as internal communities, give them back that evidence to show by being this, this type of leader, by being that social CEO, by being that vulnerable person, by being approachable and answering all those questions, this is having a huge positive impact on our organisation and the way that we're working and the way that um, our employees are feeling. So I think that it's a job to continue to coach them take away, make them feel uncomfortable, take away their scripts, but show them by doing it how impactful that is. Yeah, that's really interesting. And the theme of the, the impact, that was something that came up in uh, an episode of from, from season one of this podcast, which was um, about measurement and, and ROI and how that kind of came up throughout the, throughout the series, to be fair, and... and in one of the episodes spoke in more detail about it, but how that is often a challenge for internal comms teams to really get the measurements right to show the ROI or the impact, which is potentially a, a more accurate word or kind of can cover off more areas. And it just seems that it kind of really is a bit of a two way uh, deal with that in terms of working with the senior leaders, leaders to work out what the impact what or what the message or what the change is and what we should be measuring on on the face on the on the outcome of it um mm. it doesn't seem like it's an easy easy one to do to measure the impact but yeah very vital yeah i mean it, you know obviously you had a podcast we'll go to we could get a whole down a whole other topic of conversation about measurement as well couldn't we but it, you know in all of this it is vital we do need to get more comfortable with it we need to find more creative ways and and sometimes don't worry about it being being always perfect and sometimes it's giving that sense of sentiment but that also comes down to how we're working with our other stakeholders and those other people that capture data and information so we can show a timeline of things get more comfortable with our spreadsheets get over that thing and then it does help with and i know what's been really difficult this year is we haven't been able to plan mm -hmm. and often when you plan that's when you can define the objective that is that, that, you know hopefully it's a smart objective that's measurable in that way um so to some degree we haven't been able to do that um but i think that you know if we turn to our metrics and our data and our sentiment analysis and we we look at perhaps sickness records or complaints or other data that's in the organization yeah. perhaps speak to our external comms colleagues find out how a brand ambassadorship is going what's going on in the external world if we can stitch together a picture 
um, to show how we have done through this and what impact that has had. There is ways of doing that and not necessarily be always as polished perhaps as we would have liked it to have been, mm -hmm. but there is, you know, listening as well. What is, what's people talking about in our social channels rather than, you know, is there being great conversation? Has everyone been responded to? Is there great thanks? Can we see that happening? That information is in the fabric of our organizations. We just need to find a way to put it together and present what is going to be the most compelling elements to our leaders. Yeah, that's really interesting talking about the other business uh, metrics and I was just thinking there around how interesting it would be to almost review the change potentially in 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 stuff like glass door reviews how yeah. you know companies might have been doing really well or not so well before the pandemic and then you know based on the reviews during the the that kind of that time frame could get a really good clear picture of companies that have done really well for their employees that, that'd be quite an interesting piece to, to take a look absolutely. at absolutely absolutely um, uh, we use something uh, at stream go internally which is a high five system it's called it's called high five it's kind of an internal kind of peer recognition and it's not it's nothing more than a a way quite a fun way to say thank you leave a little message encourage to use a gif or a meme just to um put some uh, lightheartedness into it but it's a really nice way to to just kind of say thank you in potentially a more recognizable way than than just on a, a chat message It'd be interesting to see kind of how those type of systems have been used while you're not sitting next to someone and you can't maybe just go, oh, do you want a coffee from the machine or something like that type of thing? It'd be interesting to see how the use of those has increased or, or changed. And we could, that's in the, we put all these systems in place that exists in all that organization. And, and also, you know, what have you, what kind of, how has the chat happened in Yammer? What have people commented on? Or when you've had a, a virtual town hall, how have you done any sort of how people, how many, what type of questions did you get? What type of comments did you get? How were they answered? Do, did people, how did that then impact the chat afterwards? Did you see any, are we looking at perhaps looking at our ops leaders and how they're feeling about their outputs and the productivity of the organization? Are we meeting the needs of our customers? You know, there's, there's a way of stitching some kind of total picture together. Yeah, totally. That makes total sense. And talking about the, the virtual town hall, one thing that um, one of our clients do, they take kind of uh, the question questions that get submitted online um, from people watching from wherever. And they, well, some people do some kind of keyword analysis on it. It's quite sophisticated. Other people just throw it into a word cloud generator. And that's really helpful straight away to see some of the main themes that are coming out. And it's like, okay, if all the questions were about overtime or about um, childcare, the, you know, there there's some kind of things that okay. Well, we thought we we'd done a lot about that last month. Obviously, that's still kind of really top of mind, and maybe we haven't sorted that out. So there's some almost like not a plan, but there's an indicator of what we should be focusing some comms on, or yeah, you know, it's an interesting way of using that data. I thought. I think I love work, you know work it's just, and and using a visual tool to present that. Yeah, it's a really good way to think about it. Awesome. Okay. Well, I don't want to give away the, the entire report on, on the podcast. I think we could be here for, for days. Um, so the next question isn't to do the report, but it's just as important, especially as everyone has been watching telly. Um, and I didn't think I could do a, a podcast that was called Remote Control without really asking, what have you been watching and, and would you recommend it? Uh, that's a very good question. I, I, I'm, I'm sure like many people listening, I have had a, a few Netflix binges. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, with, with the lack of perhaps potential new programs coming forward, I've had to go back over some old ones. I love crime thriller dramas. They are my thing. They grip me. And it's a whole, luckily, it's nothing like my day job. <laughs> <laughs> a whole other place um so i have been watching the fall um oh, the yeah. line of duty i love a good itv drama as well like i watched all the things about dares and serial killers and some of it's a little bit worrying how much i do love it <laughs> And a, or a series about serial killers um but i think maybe it's because it's so very very different um to what i do but i would certainly recommend anyone to go for anything that's a real bit of escapism and then sometimes i do watch a little bit of friday night dinners when i need a little bit of a giggle as well oh yeah yeah oh that, that's quite quite a stark contrast between the two 
Uh, I just seen I just seen something actually. You've just started watching on Netflix uh, unsolved mysteries, which are true true oh, mysteries. That uh, that's really I don't know if you've seen it, but that, that is yeah. uh, really good. Oh, yeah, if you if you name any sort of unsolved murder mystery or documentary <laughs> on Netflix, I probably would have watched it, um, which is a little bit of a worry. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking to a pro here. I'm not going to be able to give you a recommendation, I don't think. Uh, okay, well, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast, Jennifer. It's been it's been really great, and we could carry on for ages. Or I certainly could carry on for ages talking about the report and internal comms as a whole. Um, but we have to stop. Uh, just wondering. Is uh, where can people get a copy of the report from if they want to to read it? Sure, it's publicly available on the IOIC website, which is ioic.org.uk. And if you go to our knowledge hub and then thought leadership section, you can download a real copy of the report there. Ah, oh, perfect. Okay, well, I'll make sure I'll, I'll include a link in the episode notes as well. So wherever people are listening to this, there should be a, a link to 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 read that. So yeah, just left me to say thank you very much for joining the podcast today. Lovely, thank you so much for having me too, Jack. Remote Control, an internal comms podcast by StreamGo. Go.